came you you came back all right let's do it welcome back to the fattest leech of ice and fire i am your hostess i am leech i am the one who has come up with this martin world style of analysis that yes in the end it's really about um making some educated guesses and speculating the hell out of A Song of Ice and Fire, but doing so within the means of what this author has in his own bag of tricks. Um, yeah, all right, Qu quick house housekeeping note. This camera is a new camera, and I'm not sure I really like it. It has focusing problems, so it's a good thing that this um, recording is completely 100% able to be listened to rather than me adding any visuals here. So as I said, I've um, across my blog, across, across anywhere that you know me, I've read all 80 plus of George's stories. Uh, Dream Songs 1 and 2 encompasses less than half of his written works, which is fine. You don't have to read everything all the time to know everything all the time. But what I am doing is slowly going one story at a time. And today we're going to talk about Sand Kings. And I did do a live stream with some good friends uh, about Sand Kings uh, a few short months ago, and I will link it below. Plus it's on the blog page. So all of this information I'm going over today is straight from my blog page, fattestleechoficeandfire.com. There is a book club tab, and if you click on it or even just hover on it, either way, Sam Kings is about three or four stories down at this point. So what is Sam Kings all about? Well, I'm going to do my best to not have this video run on and on and on. So if you, again, go back to my blog page, you will read all of the notes I'm going to talk about today, um, plus many, many more. And um, I'm always open to discussion about the stories um, after you've read them and you have more input. Love it, love it, love it. I mean, why else would I be doing this, this nerd stuff? So on with it. Welcome to the disturbing tale of Simon Cress and his Sand Kings. This character archetype is a favorite villain of the Martin World style, or the Martin World stories. Um, oh yes, he is a naughty child of George R. R. Martin, but one of his children nonetheless. Um, such a love he has for this mad child that um, he has used them Simon Crest as an archetype foundation for characters in Song of Ice and Fire, such as, well, primarily Daenerys and Viserys. So really this Valyrian or Targaryen um, background in, in history and in personality, they come from characters like Simon Crest. Um, same, same as a little bit for, for Euron and basically any of these two extreme uh, dragony fire elements. Um, this story exposes a, a bit of the psyche that shows the reader that we don't truly know a character until we've seen the worst of them. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> In Martin world, we don't truly know a character until we've seen the worst of them. Uh, additionally, this is another tale where George gives the main character what they ask for, only it doesn't only it doesn't only just like play out the way that it's not ex it's it's um it doesn't play out the way that one would expect or the main character would expect but it happens all the same and just to quote a line from another one of George's stories where you might not expect the way that you get something but you still get it in the end is um, 
from in the Lost Lands, which I do believe is in the process of being made into either a television show or a movie. Um, one of the the opening line says, "You can buy anything you might desire from Gray Alice, but it is better not to." So a little bit of background, just a tiny bit of background information on this story in particular. Um, it was published in Omni in 1979. I might have that version up there with my books. I can't remember. Um, Sam Kings won both uh, 1980 Hugo and Nebula Awards as well as the 1979 Best Novelette Award at Norice Con 2 in Boston. So this has been a pretty... A uh, successful story since since George put it out so many years ago, <laughs> um, and it's since been reprinted into many different anthologies, including what most people I think have nowadays. It's in Dream Songs One, so I'm working from Dream Songs One right now with the uh, Meat House Man, uh, but it's under the hybrids and horrors section of um, Dream Songs 1. If you want, if you haven't gotten to it yet, you want to jump to it and do a first read to come back and enjoy the reread with all of the notes on my blog. So Sand Kings is a little longer on this, the word count uh, side for any of the, um, the stories that I typically try to trans transcribe for the book club. Um, so I'm not expecting like a ton of like instant reactions to this. It'll take some time to read and, and reread and really let a few things soak in. Not just from um, the point of view of this story in particular, but how George has rewritten so many of these archetypes and themes um, and, and plot devices into A Song of Ice and Fire and what that means for certain characters there. Um, I have, if you go to my blog page uh, for the reread, I have broken this down into a couple of quick clickable sections if you want to sort of like jump to um, 14 different sections. I have given them all a little a little name or a little title that kind of gives you the idea of what goes on in that in that section or not quite chapters, but like, but sections. So what does George have to say on the matter? Laren Dor was published in 1976, Bitter Blooms in 1977, and The Lost Lands 1982. Old work certainly, but I always was always fond of those three stories and of the three women who starred as the protagonists, Shara, Grey Alice, and Sean of Karen Hall. None of those stories had anything to do with the Song of Ice and Fire, of course, nor even with each other. But a careful reader can find hints and shadows and seeds of many of the ideas that would later bloom in Westeros in each of them. Still, even so, they remained obscure, known only to a few. So yeah, this is what I was just saying a second ago. It's, it's, a it's a little bit longer of a story. Um... So read it, reread it, and really take it in to, to take it in and, you know, with, to what's going to happen to some characters in Ice and Fire. So what are some of those repeating themes that we say or that we see are going to happen from, from within Martin World that are also showing up in Ice and Fire, which is part of Martin World? is the desire for worship and the god complex. It's very Targaryen as well as Euron Greyjoy. Those are like the A-level um, examples that we have. But then also with um, people like Tywin and to a smaller degree, Roos Bolton be with the whole history between this, the Starks and the Red King Boltons um, throughout time that we see reoccurring now between Ramsay and John. <laughs> But let's keep going. Um, but also another note from Martin World in general on the larger scale. Uh, George often has this Targ, Targaryen, Euron characters drawn from the same prototype. I can't stress this enough. And I would continue to stress this across all, all analysis. Um, I have a, 
a page called Sewing Red Dragons, and this shows how these archetypes are drawn for each other and drawn to each other and wise. Basically, they have the, the same root um, birth, um, this, the same root background. And George has, has, in A Song of Ice and Fire, he has the literary space to expand on that, but it will all converge back together. Um, Simon Cress is um, much like what we see in Night Flyers uh, with the Dragon Mothership. Um, these are not technically part of the his George's Three Corpse Handler trio of stories, which I am currently also covering. Uh, but this is like this is corpse handling with the symbolic dead for means of war and this which is why it's again it's another very common repeating theme that we see um between sewing red dragons but it's also what blowing the dragon horn is going to do danny the unburnt is the only one the valyrian one uh, with the Valyrian magic who can blow that horn and that's what sowing red dragons is is it is going to bring her army together uh, this sort of um, this psionic link of bending people or bending in this case bending in sand kings with Simon Cress um, bending the sand kings to his will. This is something that George very clearly laid out in his 1993 outline that he was going to have Daenerys be able to do, specifically with the Dothraki. Um, where it's, and I have a link to the outline if you would like to, to read that. The outline says they're hunted by something of hers. Um, she, meaning Dar Daenerys, stumbles on a clutch of, clutch of three dragon's eggs as a young dragon will give Daenerys power to bend the Dothraki to her will. She then begins to plan her invasion of the Seven Kingdoms. So while a lot in the outline has been um, refitted to the current story we have now, he hasn't actually dropped much. Um, and Danny having this this cyanic mind link control is is one of them. This is also very much like the Harangan mines in George's Thousand Worlds universe. That's how they control things. Old Haranga is equivalent to old Valyria or Dragon Lords. Uh, we will also see some examples of chess pie, as I call it. Um, this includes collecting and purchasing armies. Um, First, Viserys tries to do it, and then with with the Dothraki, and then Danny takes over. She takes over not just f as the Valyrian or dragon lead, but she also takes over um, as the instead of a Cal, a Khaleesi. She's the first one ever, probably the first and the last Khaleesi that we're gonna have. Fire, fire, fire! Puppy eating, yeah, the whole unsullied puppy eating thing is terrible as it is to read in A Song of Ice and Fire. That's not something George made up for Danny and her arc and everything that makes up her plot. Um, yeah, it's just as terrible to read in this story as it is in Ice and Fire. Um, George also has a thing with names and naming styles. He is continuing to use the CR or KR um, naming style that breeds for dragons and this includes incest um this includes um craster and kraz and all sorts of um even um craig and karstark <laughs> and i have a whole page that that discusses why cress so so we have simon cress cress is another one that follows this kr name meaning um cress means it, it's, it's an old German word. It means it's an unflattering nickname for a greedy person. Also, also in this story, we see poisoning attempts and we have fire and blood babies where there is a good chance um, 
George was thematically calling back to this story when he later developed the Araya Targaryen and her creeping eruptions idea that we got in fire and blood. Also, Simon Crest lives on Baldor. Uh, it's a planet near Asgard. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a city near Asgard. Um, so we all know this, or most of us know this from Norse mythology, which George draws on constantly, including for Song of Ice and Fire. Um, in Norse mythology, Asgard is a fortified home to the icier tribe of gods located in the sky. So <laughs> we have like this whole grounding of sky gods going on in this story. Um, and in Norse mythology, uh, Asgard is set to be fully destroyed during Ragnarok, um, later restored after the world's renewal. So yeah, the dance of the dragons that George has promised us with in Song of Ice and Fire, as long as, as, as well as with the long night, those are going to be the things that destroys Westeros, if not Planetos, but probably Westeros in Song of Ice and Fire. And that's when we're going to have the brand, the builder, come back in to restore things after the, the destruction. Um, yeah, Sand Kings takes place in his Thousand Worlds universe post-Interregnum, which is Martin's version of Ragnarok in... Um, the Long Night of a Song of Ice and Fire. And again, I have links on about all of this information on my blog if you want some additional reading on the matter. So what does George have to say about Simon, Simon Cress in particular? Um, well, first he says this story married his sci-fi sci background to a horror plot. I totally, <laughs> totally agree. Um, and then he goes on to say, he says, I mean, really, what were these guys trying to tell me? I was an analog writer. I sold a science fact article, and they were claiming that I wrote Bat Durston stories. Of course, it was true that I had based Night Shift on my father's experiences. And even Sand Kings, a few years later, started with a guy that I knew in college and his aquarium of Piranha. But so what? When I wrote these stories, I moved them to other planets and put aliens in them and then spaceships. How much more bloody science fiction could they get? This is all part of George's furniture, furniture rule uh, that many of you might know about that I also have a video about with all of the text if you want to take a look at his furniture rule. Okay, so what happens in this story? Simon Cress is very arrogant um, as one of my friends has discussed with me for the last couple of years about the story um he's he's very arrogant um and he's getting bored he's very he's very wealthy and he's getting very bored with everything that he has his pets he collects pets uh but not just regular pets pets of war he goes to a shop that is new that he's never seen before and it's run by a woman named Wo and her partner Shade so already we have just from the very beginning we have connections to Danny and her shade tree and George has said that his plans for Wo and Shade they were going to be um, he was going to expand their travels and their experiences into like a, a little mini series um, but he only wrote this one story and during this time you see this evolution of Cress going from just sort of subtly arrogant to full arrogance into being absolutely mad with power and then coming to regret it but also acknowledging it and accepting it at the same time so it's a lot like uh, a lot of the same thematic elements that we see with Danny at the end of her final chapter in A Dance of Dragons okay I'm gonna have to put my glasses on now because my <laughs> my eyes are going crazy and starting to dry out because screens irritate them oh that's a little better okay so Cress's 
roaming around the city. And he says, this time, though, he had poor luck. Xena Pets had closed its doors. Tetherain, the pet seller, tried to foist another carrion hawk off on him. And strange waters offered nothing more exotic than new piranha, glow sharks, and spider squids. Chris had all of those. He wanted something new. So he goes in there. And it's like he's going through a portal, portal or doorway. If you, anybody knows me um, or knows me on other um, social media platforms, I talk a lot about how George uses doorways, portals in time, portals that sort of just open up to um, let his so-called dragons through. And this is where the others come from. Um, whether to, to what sort of symbolic level we'll have to wait and see, but it's not from the trees. It's some, from some sort of doorway, he even has a, a television show that he started called doorways <laughs> again, talk about this a lot, but that'll, the full subject of that will be a different video. So anyway, Simon Crest comes upon this little shop. And he says, the windows were full of mist, now a pale red, now the gray frog, the gray of a true fog, now sparkling and golden. The mist swirled and eddied and glowed faintly from within. Cress glimpsed objects in the window, machines, pieces of art, other things he couldn't recognize, but he could not get a good look at any of them. The mist flowed sensuously around them, displaying a bit of the first, bit of one thing first and then another, then cloaking all. It was intriguing. As he watched, the mist began to form letters, one word at a time. Cress stood and read, Woe and shade, importers, artifacts, art, life forms, and music. This is a lot like Illyrio in his background and him being a trader of different artifacts and how he got a hold of the dragon eggs. Whatever or wherever you think the dragon eggs came from, that's up to you. Um, at this point in the game, the Song of Ice and Fire weight game, there's probably not a mind changing that's going to go on. But Illyrio actually having those dragon eggs because he's a traitor makes perfect Martin World sense. So uh, a few other comparisons to Danny's arc with this opening scene um it's also a bit like the house of undying experience that happens um which is also something that happens in the stone city which is also a little bit of something that happens to the main character in windhaven and i'm saying this to reiterate and emphasize that this is a martin world thing um which again, and again, and I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, it's no surprise that this shade is connected with the prototype of the House of Undying. Woe functions as a quaith prototype in this story, where she's giving advice, she's giving, sharing her knowledge, and she's, she's, she's doing that thing, um, where it's like remember <laughs> remember who you are the dragons know um and yeah it's she's trying to actually woe is trying to actually guide simon cress in this movie the same way that quaith is trying to to guide danny into what she really is um even a few warnings you know quaith or yeah quaith throws some warnings in there <clears throat> and it's not that the warnings aren't true it's the interpretation of them that everybody has a problem with or difficulty narrowing down yeah so a dealer in life forms is akin to Illyrio Mepatis some other um literary artifacts that George has built into this as well is uh, we have rainbow boulevards and crystal and crystals these are all small fragments that make up the larger Song of Ice and Fire, Faith of the Seven slash Andals being in service to and paving the way for Targaryens. These are, those are the two main uh, fire elements that have come through Westeros, like pretty much bulldozed the place and started the 
um, red fire element taking everything in Westeros and mm, swinging it elementally or seasonally off balance. On the other side of that, we have the blue ice dragon others that are also doing that, swinging everything in Westeros off balance that way. Those are the two dragons that uh, George has talked about as being the title of what the title of a song of ice and fire means. A song of ice and fire essentially means a song or a battle of ice ice dragons and then fire fire dragons you can also see this um, theme repeating very heavily <laughs> very explicitly uh, in seven times never kill man and I have a link to that story that I have transcribed that's on my reread page um, also an essay of mine where I've brought together quotes from different stories um, that shows how and why this George is building up to this and it's called the steel andal invasion we even get a little bit of um of a what's called a mimic and it's from Celia's world a clever little simian not only will it learn to speak but eventually it will mimic your voice inflections gestures and even facial expressions those are the little valerians uh, or and or those are those monkeys <laughs> that um victorian that like just <laughs> that drive him crazy and he's like off with those monkeys <laughs> that that yeah <laughs> and then we start to get to sort of more of the meat of the the, the, the issue here um woe presents simon cress with something different she's like offering this and that and this and that he's like no 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 that's that's boring um and then she presents him with the sand kings and it's like chris blinked and peered and corrected himself actually only three castles stood the fourth leaned and crumbled in broken ruin the other three were crude but intact carved of some so stone and sand over their battlements and through their round porticos tiny creatures climbed and scrambled chris pressed his face against the plastic insects he asked no woe replied a much more complex life form more intelligent as well considerably smarter than your shambler they're called sand kings so essentially sand kings are sand cows of the dothraki um sand kings are dothraki um however in a song of ice and fire with Danny evolving and becoming the Khaleesi to end all Khaleesi's um, sand cal or sand Khaleesi however you want to phrase it these are all her minions so all of this spring of slaves bringing Dothraki together and stuff like that it's like we root and we cheer for it but if you know Martin's style you'll know that that is there are going to be major negative consequences to that that's not actually something we should be celebrating danny's not actually creating um a situation where she's actually freeing slaves she's she's creating a situation where she is gaining worshipful followers people that worship her i don't know if i just phrased that correctly or not so it, Cress goes on, he says, insects, Cress said, drawing back from the tank. I don't care how complex they are, he frowned. And I kindly, and kindly don't try to gull me with this talk of intelligence. These things are far too small to have anything but the most rudimentary brains. So this is near the same exact description that we get for the fire goo Grishkas from A Song for Laia. Again, I have that story transcribed and I have it linked if you want to read that story or the information about it. But going with the repeating theme in George's work of fire brings about this weird uh, off balance zealotry worship, this sort of religion or cult over and over and over again. That's what Relorism is. That's what Danny is the ultimate fire god in Song of Ice and Fire. Um, and then we even get this line <laughs> from George <laughs> about the dragons. He says, Drogon is never going to share witty aphor aphorisms with Danny. The Targaryens ruled by fire and blood, and that is what the dragons represent in this story. 
And then Woe goes on to say, they share hive minds, Woe said. Castle minds, in this case. They're the only three organisms in the tank, actually. The fourth died. See how her castle has fallen? Cress looked back at the tank. Hive minds, huh? Interesting. He frowned again. Still, it is only an oversized ant farm. I'd hope for something better. They fight wars. Wars? Hmm. Cress looked again. Okay, so yeah, remember when in a storm of swords, Danny's talking about what sort of army am I going to get? And it takes some history given to Danny from um, Jorah about the Unsullied um, and the 3,000 of Kohor and the Unsullied that kept back the Dothraki Kalasar. Um, after she learned of their capabilities in war, that's when Danny was like, okay, these puppy eating people are the ones for me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in this, in A Song of Ice and Fire, she does not say literally these puppy eating things, but George put all of these ingredients together into Danny's arc and she accepted that. And then on another fire level, the other, the other puppy consumers that we have are um, also fire people, which we have a blue fire element with Roos Bolton when he, uh, Arya, hears that he's going out hunting wolves. So that's another way that they're consuming the puppies or wolves. And then also with the fire element that is Cersei when she has um, Lady killed. Yeah, those are... Those are not good people to, <laughs> to want to win anything. Uh, let's see. Okay. Oh, and then the hive mind element. There's a lot of people, this strong idea in certain corners of the fandom that the Weirwood network is a hive mind network. Um, as if nothing that they do is independent of each other and that's actually not completely true within the way george is writing it um there are different types of hive minds i guess you can say or collective there's a collective consciousness where you just have like a library the weirwood net is a library you go into a library and there's a million books there's a different librarians and they all have different information, but they are sourced in the same place where a hive mind is one controller that has control and domain over an army or a group of things that makes them work in as one. Um, <laughs> some people may or may not be convinced of this, but I went into detail in the song for Laia about this. And again, using other George book story quotes to um, show my show show the point. So that's what the Sand Kings do. Any sort of hive mind stuff is something that works in one that has a higher controller. This is also corpse handling. A higher controller that makes everybody move as one. They fight as one. If you kill the controller. Like we see very explicitly in George's Corpse Handler story override, which I have transcribed. Um, if you kill the controller, the controllees die. We also see that in this story here. So that's the difference between a, a collective consciousness, um, those that are working for a greater good, or a hive mind, which George always writes them as some sort of fire religious war <laughs> faction. So, um, yeah, thanks for <laughs> listening to me spiel about that. And we see Simon Cress changes his mind when he finds out that they fight wars, that they are not just insects. Not only that, but they worship. And um, let's get to that. So Cress says, we get to the part where it says, Cress remained unconvinced, amusing, no doubt, but insects fight wars too. Insects do not worship, Woe said. Eh? Woe smiled and pointed at the castle. Cress started. A face had been carved into the wall. 
of the highest tower. He recognized it. It was Jello Woe's face. How? I projected a holograph of my face into the tank and kept it there for a few days. The face of God, you see. I feed them. I am always close. The Sand Kings have a rudimentary psionic sense. Proximity telepathy. I'm going to stop it right there. Proximity telepathy is something I've gone on about a lot. Again, we see this very predominantly in A Song for Laia. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, not just A Song for Laia, actually, but also in Seven Times Never Kill Man. Which is when you bring in this red worshipping element, those that are close to it can't help but be under some whatever sort of for the lack of a better word, spell or trance um, that this red pyramid <laughs> worship thing brings. We see that in a, a Song of Ice and Fire. Yes, we do. When um, Catelyn goes north, which is associated with the green and the woods and the green seeing element, she brings her own god. She brings the seven, which is all fiery worship. And she you know, and it's put into Winterfell. That's essentially like putting fire pyramid in Winterfell. Um, Melisandre being close to Stannis, you know, when she's near him, he has this compulsion. Um, um, what's his name? Jamie being with Cersei. Cersei being another fire worship element. When he's away from her, that's when he falls out of this persuasion. And when he receives that letter from her where she's like, help me, help me, help me. He's like, nope, put it in the fire because he's not next to her. Um, we see it in a few other ways as well. But that's what proximity telepathy is. So we know that the weird words in the Song of Ice and Fire are often, but not, al not always carved with an expression that represents some action of the story that is an inverse parallel that george is using um, humans are the ones that worship the trees this way and sometimes carve faces into them so that's that's a human element gray area there the trees do not require worship as the green gods for simplicity's sake um, is in everything as the story says, they're in the earth, the trees, the stones, the the worms, and some winds and things like that. Jala Woe Jala is often representing the green naturistic ap approach in this story, as opposed to how um, we will see si Simon Crest split off and devel develop his own persona. The only god in a song of ice and fire that requires worship or sacrifice is the greedy, hungry god that is always hungry fire. Those are the words of the story. This is the crux of the variation on the gods. One serves the many and requires um, sacrifice. The other requires blood and fire and worship to feed the self. So one feeds the many and will occasionally require personal sacrifice, like being the the lead green seer like blood raven or bran um the other requires you to sacrifice something to it to feed it because it serves and feeds the self and then if you want to pile it on even more whoa smart or let's back up one line <laughs> tell me more Chris said yay huzzah <laughs> Woe smiled. The Maul lives in the castle. Maul is my name for her. A pun, if you will. The thing is mother and stomach both. Female, large as your fist. Immobile. Acting, actually, Sand King is a bit of a misnomer. The mobiles are peasants and warriors. The real ruler is a queen. <laughs> but that analogy is faulty as well. Considered as a whole, each castle is a single hermaphroditic creature. So oh, that brings us to Song of Ice and Fire again. A Feast for Crows, Samwell, what is that, four. What fools we were who thought ourselves so wise. The error crept in from the translation. Dragons are neither male nor female. Barth saw the truth of that. But now 
not now, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but now one and now the other is changeable as flame. The language misled us all for a thousand years. Daenerys is the one born amidst smoke and salt. The dragons prove it. Danny is the maw and her dragons are the stomach, <laughs> essentially. I mean, think about it. Um, dragons eat a lot. Um, when you read this story and how much the Sand Kings consume, and then you go and you read A Song of Ice and Fire and how much the sand or the dragons there consume, and how even the Dothraki is described that as they go through the land, they're like locusts. They leave nothing behind. They just consume it all. Um, and there's even the fact that Drogon ate Hosea. So she's, he's already consumed a child. Then Simon Cress asks, what do they eat? The mobiles eat pap, pre-digested food obtained inside the castle. They get it from the mall after she has worked on it for several days. Their stomachs can't handle anything else. So if the mall dies, they soon will die as well. The mall, the mall eats anything. You'll have no special expense there. Table scraps would do excellently. Live food, Cress asked. <laughs> I mean, come on. Whoa shrugged. Each mall eats mobiles from the other castle. Yes, I am intrigued, he admitted. If only they weren't so small. So guess what? Malls are kept in a dragon pit. I mean, not a dragon pit, an aquarium. <laughs> they only grow as big as their surroundings allow them, just like the dragons do in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, hmm. <laughs> So, I mean, it's as much of a horror story this is as m when you think about how very, very much, even almost literally line for line, has been repurposed into Danny's arc. Danny's arc, just like Bran's arc, but in an opposite parallel sort of way, Danny is the, the hidden monster where Bran was raised on... Um, children's monster stories because it's something he has to learn from because it's something he's going to have to, f to face. Now, oh, let me just add this too. If you need another good reason to, to reread this story, I've added a lot of the artwork from um, the, uh, the, the story, not just in dream songs, but also in a graphic novel. Yeah, so there's some there's some visual learning too for those visual learners like myself. Okay, so I just had to go grab this really quickly. I totally forgot I had this until right now. This is the Sand King's graphic novel. So uh, yeah, it's beautiful. And um, it's really scary. It's, you know, scary at some parts, you know, you must be punished. So yeah, there's a couple different ways you can get a hold of this story and get the big picture. So I've talked a lot about the origin of Simon Cress and like the origin of this story. And um, that setup is very good for the rest of the, the bulk of the middle of the story where Cress starts to have these... Um, um, fighting. He starts, he, he starts to, to mistreat his sand kings and he forces them to grow larger and to, 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 he forces them into battles where woe is like, no, just, just let nature take its course. Just feed them regularly and they will war at their own pace and it will be artful. And Simon Cress is like, no, I need this now. I need this now. I need an army now. And, um, so he forcibly starts to take over and manipulate the situation. But we don't really see the outcome of this until later in the story. Again, you know, like I said in the beginning, you don't really know who these characters are until you see them at their worst. And that's, um, that's what we see Cress evolving into along the way. There's even um, a part that is that George has 
going back to to pull out for Lady Stoneheart. You know, we're talking about war and um, manipulating the situation for for battle and for war. There's this part it says Kath Mullane was dead in his hand. He could report it, plead that it had been an accident, unlikely. He had run her through after all. He had already told the pol the policer to leave her to him. He would have to get rid of the evidence. Hope that she had not um, told anyone where she was going this morning. That was probable. So there's this whole thing where he accidentally kills Kath. <laughs> Kath Mullane, and that was his girlfriend, and um, this, yeah, this brings us back to George's outline again, where George didn't really give up on everything in his outline, he just reworked it into what is now currently A Song of Ice and Fire. So there's a small note in there where it says, um, Catelyn Tully Stark was going to have been killed by the Ice Dragon others, and that's how we we're to get Lady Stoneheart. But what we have here is another cat that is killed also by a dragon person. And for a little while, he sort of like, she sort of like psychologically haunts him. So again, um, all Martin World stuff. Huzzah! <laughs> then we get to some descriptions where it says 70... Some 70 kilometers north of Cress's estate was a range of active volcanoes. So again, we're back to this like pyramid volcano thing, just like in A Song for Laia, just like we have in um, Valyria, um, and even parts of George's corpse handling series. It says he, f he, flew, he flew back there um, using Kath's skimmer in tow. Above the glowering cone of the largest volcano he released the magna lock and watched it vanish into the lava below so readers of martin's work in this blog i will say this often is you know how many times george puts the fiery characters in with volcanoes um even stannis with melisandre going under dragonstone which i forgot to mention this earlier um dragonstone being the way this whole valyrian architecture that is um, what the Sand Kings build in this story. What they are doing is they're essentially building Valyrian architecture point one, uh, 1.0. Um, Dragonstone is looks like giant, you know, like a mash of giant dragons all together. Um, that's what that is. Um, and underneath of that is all of the, um, the lava, um, different glass of different colors back to the rainbow thing again, back to the crystals again. So Dragonstone and Valyria and the pyramids with Bacalon, um, the pyramids with Drant, with, um, with Danny and, and her dragons on top. That is, Danny is also just straight up one of George's, um, proto- um, reworks of his god called Bacalon from his stories. Again, I have a whole page on that if you want to read it. Um, they're all analogous to each other. It's the whole fire element. In this story, there's also a, um, a scene where Simon Crest takes a sword. He's a sword from the sky and he goes and he starts smashing some of the, some of the castles. That is an Azor Ahai dragon rider dragon flame all of again all of that's analogous it's all furniture depending on what story you're in that's what we're going to see in song of ice and fire danny's going to burn things down and um yeah this is as george keeps saying he this is something that he's been <laughs> um planning since the beginning of the story he's still going to go with his own ending and if we follow martin world this is what happens in Martin world. And we already see it going on in ice and fire. Uh, then we get to some parts where we have elements that are like the wind blown. Yes. Even small details. Um, and the tattered prints and a cloak of many colors. I mean, it just goes on and on. It's actually quite interesting to read for me and hopefully for you, because it makes ice and fire 
that much more juicy. Um, even though we don't have the winds of winter and the dream of spring yet, we have a pretty good idea where certain things are going. Whether or not we like it is, <laughs> is another story, literally, but... Yeah, then we have some sections that are like Quentin Martell going down into the dragon pit and being consumed or burned by Rhaegal. Um, the darkness, the smells, the screaming and pain. Um, this is also very much like the scene in Night Flyers when Lamy Thorne is consumed by the Ice Dragon Maul ship that is the Night Flyer. Those two scenes I've written a lot about, like did a, a line by line comparison if you want to read it. It's there. So then um, Chris goes through these changes and the faces on his castles that the, that the worshiping little sand kings are building, they're changing. The faces are changing. They're going from sort of simple and neutral to something different ones are like bloated and they're twisted and they're angry. Um, again, we see this outwardly with um, the weirwood trees when George is emphasizing what's going on in a scene um, but it's not going to be quite as literal as what we see those are those are perceptions by characters in the story we see it a little bit more literally when people look into the flames and they see red mice at play they see faces in the flames and they are changing and it's predictive of the story as a whole as opposed for like just the character um and then we get to the parts where there's even um faceless men faceless men are a fiery organization and Arya needs to escape those bros as soon as she can Lysandra the name is a precursor to Melisandra and both are fire elements they both are hands of the king um Lysandra works for um, a company that is somewhat like the faceless men and the fact that they go through and they um, destroy they're sort of, it's sort of this black and white situation where they go through and they destroy <laughs> people that are opposed to them um, for hire and that's what being a slave to R'hllor is all about um, but there's more Melisandre in origins from the story bitter blooms if you want to check that out again have that linked um and then we keep going one thing i will say and i will explain this more in my upcoming magic or quote magic um video is um where's my cheat sheet <laughs> you see in in ice and fire you see a lot of similarities between the types of magic that's being used that's because all of it comes from nature what defines it as like the green the red or the blue is essentially up to the individual and how they choose to use it so you can misuse something that somebody else is using for the good um why am i saying this because simon crest starts to realize that he has a mental psionic connection to th these maws and um, he starts to feel hungry when they do and he starts to feel satisfied after eating when they do and he even has some share some emotions or s slight ref reflections of emotions um, of you know being scared and whatnot that they do just like we see um, the dragons react to Danny when Danny gets scared or horny or um, put off by Jorah kissing her things like that but on the other side, we also know that the Stark kids and presumably other s skin changers and or wargs, that they share a lot of the same feeling and emotions that they that they do with the animal that they're bonding with. Um, that brings us to this line, he says, a white sand king watched him from atop the dresser in his bedroom, its antenna moving faintly. It was as big as the one in the skimmer the night before. He tried not to shrink away. I'll, I'll feed you, he said to it. I'll feed you. His mouth was horribly dry, sandpaper dry. He licked his lips and fled the room. 
Um, so this is very superficially, it's similar to a type of mental feeding. That's what's happening here. Um, this is why Jojen has to tell Bran that you go through when you, you know, bond with Summer, do all this stuff, learn from Summer, but keep yourself human. Keep yourself separate from that. Move the sticks, pee on the rock, do, you know, whatever it is. Um, don't become, don't get lost is what it is. Don't fall into that sea and get lost and drown. So Simon goes through all this, all these transitions, all these changes. Um, and then the last section we get is very much like Danny searching for the house with the red door. I've said this for a long time. Um, I don't know if Danny has some sort of false memory or she has something from the future that's being fed back to her. I don't know. I don't like messing with the timeline too much. But the house with the red door is a bit of a false memory, a false sense of security for Danny. That's not something straight from her childhood, which is questionable in some, some aspects anyway. That's not something sweet she's going to go back to. This is where she wants to get something and she's going to regret getting it in the end because it's not good. It's something that's, it's, it's a final fire consumption that's going to consume her. It's going to be her death, essentially. This section starts with, he had not counted on the heat. Um, and he's, he's out in the desert and he's looking around. He's trying to find, he's left his house because there's too much destruction that has gone on at his house that he caused. And um, so he escapes, he goes out and he's in the desert and he's walking around. This is a lot like Danny out on the red waste and he's thirsty and things are around him are dead and he's looking for a house but through all of this he says he had his own plans for woe and shade it was all their fault crest decided and they would suffer for it lissandra was dead but the others knew but the, but the others knew he knew others in her profession I he would have his revenge. He promised himself that a hundred times as he struggled and sweated his way east. Yeah, so there's a little bit of the direction thing as well. He's told the same to go south, go east, go north, go west, and things that whole directional confusion thing. Yes, that has come from Sand Kings. <laughs> That's Simon Cress. Um, so he's out wandering the desert, trying to go east, to go west, to try to find some sort of safety and what does he find he finds literally a house with a red door so remember George this is a short story so all of this stuff is here but George has the room in A Song of Ice and Fire the literary room that's been expanded to here to take these stories and stretch them out um, so the events and the um, are what happen and what happened to the characters are the most important um, rather than like literally like a one for one to one. And then we get to a part where Simon, um, he's running and he's scraping his hands on the rock and it came away bloody and he sucked it as he walked and he worried about infection and all this stuff again. That's Danny's final chapter that we have so far in A Dance with Dragons, um, where she's climbing down Dragonstone and she's She's getting sick and she's, she had the beginnings of a fever. And then Simon Cress, <laughs> uh, he thinks he finds a house. He thinks he finds these little children, these little dusky children, little dusky children. And he says, they came running toward him. Cress stopped suddenly. No, he said, oh no, no, no. He backpedaled, slipped on the sand, got up and tried to run again. They caught him easily. They were ghastly little things with bulging eyes and dusky orange skin. He struggled, but it was useless. Small as they were, each of them had four arms and Cress only had two. So this is one of George's mergings. Yes, he loves the science fiction angle, the mad scientist angle, where you, t where you take two different species and you put them together. It's genetic engineering. He loves it. It also happens in the Song of Ice and Fire, but on the magic, or I'm sorry, the, the uh, yeah, like the magic or fantasy level rather than with tech. But that's all furniture. 
that's for a different that's for a different video actually i already have that video up <laughs> yeah this is where he um then goes on to say they carried him toward the house it was a sad shabby house built of crumbling sand but the door was quite large and dark and it breathed it that was terrible but it was not the thing that set Simon Crest to screaming. He screamed because of the others, little orange children who came crawling out of the castle and watched impassively as he, as he passed. All of them had his face. Yeah, this is the... And I have some additional quotes from A Song of Ice and Fire in the story, but this is where Danny's headed if she doesn't make some changes, which I don't think George is having her make any changes, especially if he's going with the same ending that he started back in 91 yeah um including danny's visions about a white lion running through the tall grass taller than man the line of a snake um a lot of these things that she sees um in a clash of kings like a little girl ran barefoot towards the big house with the red door mary Mazdor shrieked in the flames a dragon bursting from her back her brow behind the silver horse of bloody corpse this is all simon crest stuff so if you i'm just over an hour oh my god you guys are crazy so read this story that's why i'm here is to try to encourage you to read these stories so we can nerdily discuss them um on my blog or online somewhere else where you can find me and um plus it's just fun it gives us something to do until we as we patiently patient patiently wait for the winds of winter and a dream of spring right um so thank you immensely for sticking with the story so far. Um, again, I want to go back to a George quote really quickly. Um, when he was talking about writing this story, uh, and I have the full quote in the beginning of the page, but I want to go back to it and ask you again. Um, after you've read this story, George asks, is this the best thing I ever wrote? You be the judge. So what say you? So again, thanks for hanging out with me and let me know how your reread goes. I appreciate you being here and I have more, at this point, more corpse handling coming up and then maybe a video on the three aspects of magic. Goodbye.